Okay. Making sure that my microphone is on here too. Uh, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Um, dear Lord God, again, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here tonight and that you've brought us through yet another day. We ask that you continue to be with us and grow us in our faith and trust in you. As we see here in our study this evening, we're reminded of those promises of our God and of our Savior from sin. Uh, bless us in our study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. One of the really cool things that we're going to be able to take a look here in the review, um, if you're following along on the PDF version, the hard copy, and feel free to contact me, pick one up here at church. Uh, we're on the taking it deeper section there on page 21. And the first question that we have is, all people naturally know deep down in their hearts that Jesus is their Savior. Disagree. Yeah, we disagree. We'd all be Christians yeah, uh, that's true. We'd all be Christians otherwise. Uh, naturally, man knows that there is a God by nature and conscience, as we had discussed uh, last time. Uh, but to know about a Savior, that's recorded for us in Scripture. Um, how about the next one? Agree or disagree? You must keep God's law perfectly to be saved. Okay. If you keep God's law perfectly, well, you're one of a kind. In fact, there's only one person who could keep God's law perfectly, and that's Jesus. Since the Bible was written almost 2,000 years ago, we can't be sure that our Bibles today contain the true word of God. Yeah, and we disagree. How can we be certain that our Bibles contain the true word of God? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, it's on the back side here on page 22. Uh, but first, we want to take a look at the uh, law or gospel Bible passages here read the Bible passage, and then write in the box to the left where the passage is law or gospel. So the first one, law or gospel. Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. Yeah, law. Again, the law shows our sin, tells us what to do. Luke 2, verse 11. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Gospel? Same thing with Galatians 4, verse 4 then, right? God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of Son. Anything that we would say gospel, as we had looked at that acronym last time, SOS shows our sins. Or excuse me, <laughs> gospel shows our Savior. The law shows our sins. The gospel shows our Savior. How about Ephesians 2, 8 to 9? For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Gospel? Yeah. And then finally, Romans 3, verse 12. All have sinned, all have turned away. There is no one who does good, not even one. Law. Yep, law. Oh, no, you're doing great. Okay, so one of the cool things that I love about this lesson is here found on the back on page 22. More manuscript evidence for the New Testament. How can we know, as that statement said, how can we be sure that our Bibles can today contain the true word of God? There's more abundant and accurate manuscript evidence for the New Testament than any other book from the ancient world. Consider the following extant manuscripts. 
This John Rylands fragment of papyrus contains five verses from John's Gospel, and it's dated between 117 and 138 A.D. That's going back a long ways, isn't it? Like almost the original. The Bodmer papyri, dated around 200. They contain most of the Gospels of John and Luke, along with the books of Jude, 1st and 2nd Peter. And these are also the earliest known complete copies of the New Testament books. Codex Vaticanus, between 325 and 350 AD, contains the whole New Testament, as well as the Greek Old Testament. The Codex Sinaiticus, around 340, contains the whole New Testament and half of the Old Testament. Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. This manuscript dated around 350 AD contains only part of the Old Testament but most of the New Testament. The Codex Alexandrinus dated around 450 is a complete manuscript of the Bible but with only minor mutilations, and it's housed in the National Library of the British Museum. So, what does this all mean? As you can tell, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Ephraimi, Rescriptus, and Alexandrinus came from different locations. But the grand total of surviving copies of the Greek New Testament is around 5,000. Compare how well the New Testament has been copied and preserved to other ancient writings. Take a look. How many copies of the first century BC of Caesar are available? Ten. And the earliest copy that we have is from 900 AD. Livy, Tacitus's Annals, right? Twenty. 31 copies. And again, those 1st century BC or 1st century AD books and those authors, the earliest copies only go back so far. Uh, Thucydides and Herodotus, both 5th century BC authors, uh, there are only 8 copies available. Demosthenes, there's 200 copies. Homer, 643 copies, but in the New Testament, over 5,000. Now, if from the standpoint of a documentary historian, the New Testament has a vastly superior evidence to that of any other book from the ancient world. Most ancient writings survive only a handful of manuscripts, while the New Testament boasts thousands. The oldest surviving copy of most ancient writings comes from a thousand years after the original. While the oldest surviving copies of the New Testament comes from just a generation or two after Christ. The accuracy and consistency of the New Testament message is unparalleled, unparalleled <laughs> in all other literature. Instead of not trusting the Bible unless it's backed up by secular writings, we shouldn't trust secular writings unless they're backed up by the Bible. That's how excellent and well-preserved of a historical document that it is. Any questions there? I just think it's a neat part of history to know that God's word was preserved and that it can be trusted and true. Okay, we will take a look at the fall and promises of a Savior. And this is adapted from Genesis 12 and 15. As 75-year-old Abram packed his bags, his family thought he was crazy. He had received a vision from God saying, Leave your country your people and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. His family and friends asked, why? 
Why you? Why now? Are you sure this wasn't just some crazy dream? But Abram was very sure, because in that vision, God had also given him a promise so wonderful he could scarcely believe it. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And one day, through your descendants, all nations on earth will be blessed. It was the unlikeliest of promises, especially when made to a childless 75-year-old man whose wife was infertile. And yet, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and set out for the land of Canaan. As 80-year-old Abram lay awake in his tent, he began to wonder, Am I crazy? He wasn't getting any younger, and since the vision five years ago, his wife Sarai had shown no signs of being pregnant. How could God's promise be fulfilled? As Abram tossed and turned, unable to sleep, suddenly the Lord appeared to him a second time. Do not be afraid, Abram, the Lord said. I am your shield, your very great reward. God then led Abram outside where a dazzling array of stars winked down from the dark near eastern sky. Count the stars, if indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. As 100-year-old Abraham held his newborn son in his arms, tears rolled down his cheeks, God had kept his promise after all and had brought about a miracle that anybody on earth would have said was impossible. As Abraham looked at the baby in his arms, his heart swelled with hope that God would keep the rest of his promises too. The promise of a land to call his own? The promise of a mighty nation made up of his own descendants? And above all, the promise of another baby boy who would come to save his people from their sin. This lesson today focuses on the origin of sin, God's gracious plan of salvation, and the way he made that plan known to his people throughout the period we have come to call the Old Testament. Okay. I'm going to grab a Bible here. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. 
The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they became come one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now in chapter 3. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, I don't know about you, but I read this verse, and it's like, well, we just got done reading God's instructions to Adam and Eve. Eat from any tree in the garden, but not this tree. Not this tree here in the middle. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now we'll continue on with Genesis 3, verse 8 and following here. But we want to start out by asking a couple of things. If God created a perfect world, then where did sin come from? It didn't originate with God, but was brought into the world by a fallen angel called Satan, or the devil. If you read through Revelation chapter 12, you can read a little bit more on that. He came to the garden in the form of a serpent and convinced Adam and Eve to rebel against God. Oh, would you read that first passage there, Melissa? Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. How did sin enter the world? Through Adam and Eve. Yep, through Adam and Eve's sin. Now, God's perfect world was now broken, but he refused to destroy it and start over. Instead, as soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin, God revealed his plan to save them. Uh, would you read Ezekiel 33 there? So what does this Bible passage teach us about God's will or God's desire for all people? Does he want them to live or does he want them to die? Yeah, he wants every person to live, even the wicked. He wants them to turn from their ways and live. How do we know this is true? Uh, much is made about evil people in the world, particularly, uh, let's say, evil people throughout world history. Um, people like Adolf Hitler, for example, who killed and slaughtered people. And you go throughout history, and there has been a track record of people doing foolish things like this, and we would call them wicked people. So it's God desire even for them to turn from their ways and live? Well, when we read that passage, it's not so much just the wicked people out there. What about the wickedness inside my own heart? And that's the part in particular that allows for self-reflection to realize God doesn't want me to perish. How do I know this? Well, let's take a look at what he did for Adam and Eve. We'll read then, continuing on in Genesis 3, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? 
He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. What are Adam and Eve doing? <laughs> Blaming each other. Is this typical in marriage, in people, in relationships today? Absolutely. So the Lord God then said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now that passage from Genesis 3, verse 15, that you see there in front of you, is particularly special. Because with this singular promise, God had vowed to both restore mankind's relationship with God and destroy the work of Satan. So when we refer to the first promise in the Garden of Eden, we often refer to Genesis 3.15. And we'll go through that passage in a second. Then in verse 16 and following, To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, a note about this, what God is doing here in saying this to both Adam and Eve, right, about childbearing being difficult and about work being hard, are those two things true? Yeah. Now, Adam named his wife, and these are what we would call results of sin. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Picking up there in verse 21 now. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Okay. Genesis 3.15, like we had said, right? I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God saying to the serpent, cursing the serpent. Let's take a look there at that verse and identify to whom each pronoun is referring. So the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between. I is God. You is the devil. Your offspring is referring to the devil's offspring, or unbelievers. And her offspring, Eve's offspring, would be referring to believers. Now if you look in the right-hand column, let's continue with the second half of the verse. He will crush your head. He refers to the Savior. Your head, again, who is he talking to? The devil. So the Savior will crush the devil's head. <coughs> and you, the devil, will strike his, the Savior's, heel. Now God promises a human, singular male descendant with the power to defeat the devil. The only person who fits this description is Jesus. Uh, would you read 1 John 3, verse 8 there? Okay. 
Isn't that awesome? To think about why Jesus appeared? Jesus appeared to destroy the devil's work. God had promised that a special person would come from Adam and Eve's family. God eventually made that family into a people or nation. The Old Testament is the history of that nation. Now, let's take a few minutes and we'll walk through the timeline of Old Testament history. So you go back. Um, the acronym BC stands for years before Christ. AD stands for Anno Domini, or in the year of our Lord, um, the Latin for it. And now we are in the year 2022 AD, so over 2,000 years after the birth of Christ. Noah, 2,500 years before Christ. Uh, that's going back into the book of Genesis. In Genesis, many people were living for, if you read through Genesis chapter 5, 900 years at a time. Here's a trivia question for you. Who is the longest living person that's recorded in scripture? If you remember his name and the length of years that he had lived. Um, close to it. He lived 969 years. So if you look in Genesis chapter 5, 969 years, Methuselah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Methuselah lived for that long. And in Genesis chapter 5, it is a chronological history from Adam all the way to Noah. Now, what's different about Noah? Noah, at the ripe old age of 500 years, received a call from the Lord to do a thing for him. And it was a, a special mission that God had given to Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, we're told about mankind, that God looked down on the earth and saw that the inclination of man's heart was only evil all the time depending on which translation you use, but only evil all the time. So if man's heart was wickedness, God wanted to do something about it. Um, sin entered the world, right? Adam and Eve, sin entered the world, and it's only progressively getting worse, so what am I going to do about it? God had and would send a flood on the earth and destroy wickedness. And in a sense, start over, and would start over with Noah and his family. So we're told that it took Noah 120 years. He completed the construction of the ark. If you want to go see a replica of it, drive down to northern Kentucky and go visit the ark encounter. Uh, we did that with our teen group on the way to youth rally, what, four years ago, and it was outstanding. But you kind of get the sense of, hey, this is how big it was. I mean, the thing is massive. But God had told Noah, construct this and you'll be safe in the midst of the heavens and the earth opening up and filling up with water. So that's Noah's story. 40 days and 40 nights in the middle of a torrential downpour and uproar of the deep. Um, killing every living thing that wasn't on the ark. Now, God preserved that promise, right? What did he say? I am going to send someone to crush the devil. So Adam's descendant, recorded in Genesis chapter 5, all the way to Noah, Noah, descendant of Adam. Now, Noah's descendants, after him, would lead all the way to Abraham. 
Okay? Abraham, 500 years later, 5, 000, 2000 BC, roughly. And we read a little bit of that at the beginning of our lesson today. Abraham was given a promise. You don't have kids now, but I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Did God keep his promise? Absolutely he did. It didn't seem like it because who in their right mind would be able to have kids? Now people aren't living 900 years anymore. Noah, would, or excuse me, Abraham and the people after him would only live to be about 100 or so. Abraham a little bit longer. But Abraham at the ripe old age of 100 had a child. Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, his son, Jacob, his grandson, are considered the big three of the forefathers, um, heroes of faith in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a period 2,000 years before Christ. After that, there was a famine in the land. Jacob and all of his children went into Egypt to be able to simply survive. And they stayed there, and after a time, bless you, after a time, they became slaves to the Egyptian. So you see, in that timeline between Moses and David, or excuse, excuse me, between Abraham and Moses, they were in Egypt. That's the period that we see in Exodus then, where Moses would be called out at 1500 year BC, so another 500 years later, to lead God's people out of Egypt and then back to the promised land. Again, we're talking descendants of Christ. Moses, after 40 years of wilderness, wandering in the wilderness, God led his people to the promised land of Canaan. There's a period there where there were no kings, we call this the days of the judges. You kind of see it split up on the screen in that timeline there. On your paper, it's consecutive. 500 years between Moses and David, roughly. Now, David was not the first king. The first king after the period of the judges, people like Gideon, Samson, well-known judges, Then came the first king of Israel, King Saul, who was a good king for a while, but then turned, uh, turned away from the Lord. God then chose David to take Saul's place. David was about 1,000 years before Christ. King David had many um, wonderful examples of faith uh, throughout his time. We think of a time when he was just a young boy and he went and slayed the giant Goliath and led God's people, the Israelites, to victory over the Philistines. But we also see in David's life times of weakness and failure when he fell into sin. His sin with Bathsheba, um, other, other times in his life. Now, from that time from David to Isaiah, shortly after David, his son Solomon, uh, wise King Solomon, and then following Solomon, the divided kingdom, all the way to Isaiah at 700 B.C., when we're talking about exile of the northern part of the kingdom, right? It's divided into two, the north and the south. Northern kingdom, northern tribes of Israel, taken into captivity and then in 722 B.C. and then in 586 B.C. the southern tribe of Judah taken into captivity. We're looking at both the Babylonians and the Assyrians or Assyrians and Babylonians. And then finally Jesus. We see there on that timeline at 0 A.D. Now, think about the promises of a Savior which God made to his people throughout that timeline. 
I highlighted just a few things in each of their lives. You could, you could spend the better part of the next month reading through all of that and spend a good deal every day <laughs> trying to read through all that history. Right? But there were some major promises that were given along the way. Promises that would eventually be fulfilled by Christ. So Jesus in 0 AD, Adam's, Abraham's, and King David's heir, the prophet, the servant of the Lord, who will die as a priest sacrifice for our sins. Take a look at that first promise. All the way down at the bottom, Adam in 4000 BC. Isn't that the one that we read before? From Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'm going to send you an offspring that will defeat Satan. In 2000 BC, God gave that promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, offspring that will bless the whole world. In 1500 BC, on to the right, Moses. A uh, promise was given in Deuteronomy 18 that the prophet will be raised up. In 1000 BC, King David's heir, the Son of God, will reign forever in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 700 BC, God gave the promise to Isaiah the prophet, or through Isaiah the prophet, that the servant of the Lord will die as a priest's sacrifice for our sins. Every prophecy continues to tell another layer of historical evidence and truth that points to one person accomplishing what? What would this one person accomplish? Go back a couple slides. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And that's what these promises highlighted, as you see here on the screen in front of you. Okay, any questions? No, that's a lot. It is. But what I'd like you to do is this. For next time, do the Taking It Deeper section on page 26, and then also read the account of the worldwide flood that I highlighted with Noah in Genesis 6 to 8, and then bring any questions that you might have to our class next time. Okay? I give you one highlight, Genesis 6, verse like 3 or 4. The inclination of man's heart was only evil all the time. There are other intricate details that you'll probably find quite interesting. Any other questions? We are done a little bit early today, uh, but we will close with prayer. Uh, dear Lord God, again, we thank you uh, for your grace and every blessing that you gave this promise to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they sinned and that you kept this promise throughout all time, that you sent your son Jesus to destroy the devil's work. Thank you for this gift and this blessing, and thank you for giving me the faith to believe it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we will stop the presentation now.